So I'm Jeremy Kennedy and I'm one of the two ag teachers here at Phoenix High School. We're here in my classroom. Uh, I've been an ag teacher here at Phoenix. Uh, I'm starting my 11th year. I've been in the profession for 13 years. Uh, so that's here at Phoenix. I actually was going to be a herdsman. That was my whole goal in life. I went to Oregon, well I went to Limit Community College first and I was on their livestock judging team. Uh, and then I went to Oregon State and was on their livestock judging team. And uh, I was just about ready to graduate and I wanted to be a herdsman. I was really hoping to be on a purebred operation somewhere in the Midwest and be in charge of their whole program. And then it kind of hit me that, you know, that's a great thing to do for a couple of years, uh, but, but what's better than that? And so I was actually uh, sitting on the couch watching TV there in my house that I lived at at Oregon State and a friend of mine who was going to become an ag teacher I uh, was getting ready to go to a conference and and uh, a person by the name of Dr. Greg Thompson who was the department head at Oregon State for ag education for a long time he came up to me and as I'm laying there on the couch he says I think you should be an ag teacher and I thought hmm interesting and so I just kinda didn't go anywhere with it and then I kinda started thinking about it and some other people were very influential in me becoming an ag teacher as well. Uh, John Dimmick, who taught at Crater for a lot of years, retired in 2003. Uh, he was also instrumental in me becoming an ag teacher. So I just kind of, I, I delayed my graduation so that I didn't have to take more classes at, at a, as a graduate student. And so I went to my second senior year, as I like to call it, at Oregon State, got my prerequisites done for ag education. Uh, then I got into the master's program. It was <laughs> funny because I had I graduated before I'd have never met my wife. Uh, we didn't meet until that second senior year. Uh, got into the master's program and did my student teaching at Crater uh, with Mr. Dimmick, and then got hired there right out of college and then came here three years after that. And we moved to Malala when I was in the seventh grade and that's when I got my first experience with agriculture other than uh, going to some of my families up in the Willamette Valley, distant relatives hop farm in uh, St. Paul. And so we got cows uh, when we moved to Malala and we were there until I was a junior in high school and then I moved to Vail, Oregon. And my family actually moved to Vail a year before that. Uh, and so I moved to Vail, I graduated from Vail High School, I consider Vail where, where I'm from even though I've been, I've had the unique opportunity of living in all areas of our state. Uh, my little brother still lives in Vail with his wife and three kids. And my mom and my stepdad live in Vail, uh, so my heart's still still there. Boy, you know they're all different in terms of the agriculture, and and it all goes to with the topography, with the amount of rainfall, especially in our state. Rainfall is so determined on what you have. Uh, when we were in the Lamont Valley, we had a small cattle operation, purebred Charolais. Uh, we were all on grass pastures. We didn't raise any hay because it was too expensive to have enough ground to do that, so we bought ground. Whereas when we were in eastern Oregon, we had a little bit larger area, uh, had a way better opportunities to buy alfalfa a lot cheaper, buy our other stuff. So it all depends upon where you're from in terms of what happens. I've got some farmers that I've worked for over in Vail in Ontario uh, that raise, have raised spuds, soybean, or spuds, corn, wheat, uh, sugar beets and they used to do that in a rotation and onions and now they're mainly onions corn and alfalfa so it's interesting how just their stuff has changed and then of course uh, central Oregon high desert Lot, lots of crops in central Oregon uh, especially towards uh, the northern part of central Oregon Madras a lot of grass seed in Madras one of the cool things we also get to do as an ag teacher is we go on Oregon ag tour we've taken kids uh, three times since I've been here at Phoenix uh, this last time we started in California on Highway 101 and went clear the length of the coast and we toured agriculture all along the length of the coast and so that was pretty pretty exciting especially for those kids to see that different stuff that happens and and our state's so unique I mean you can go we can drive an hour and we're at the coast a whole different agriculture drive an hour to the east and we're in the Klamath Basin which I, I farmed in the Klamath Basin with some friends 
uh, when I was after 2000. I think it was the year after 2000. 2000 they lost water and so the year after that I went to work for Cleaver Farms over there and farmed with them for the summer because I wanted to see what that opportunity was like uh, and I, I did it for next to nothing just for the experience so yeah. So I'm an ag teacher and FFA is intracurricular so I also have uh, a, an extended contract, so I have a 24-day extended contract, 26-day extended contract uh, to do the FFA throughout the school year that's not covered by my teaching contract. And then I, we also get a stipend to cover the stuff by our teaching contract that's after hours. So for example, like today, we were here for ag sales uh, an hour after contract. So that would cover underneath that small stipend. And then the, all that extra time we spend during the summertime and on uh, days off when other teachers are on spring break, we're at state convention, uh, that covers during our, our extended contract. Ag education, uh, so FFA is a part of ag education. FFA is an intracurricular part of ag education. So in all of our classes, uh, kids take ag classes here at the high school, and in all of those classes they have the opportunity to be in FFA. So we learn agriculture in the classroom. We experience agriculture in the FFA. And so they get the opportunity to either raise an animal, a lot of our kids raise animals for the fair, or some of them work for family members, and so that's that piece. And then there's another piece of it, and that's this contest and these CDEs, these career development events, where they get to take some of this other knowledge they get in the classroom and really get the opportunity to see what they know against other people. So those are kind of our three, so we call it the three circle model, ag education, supervised agriculture experience which is raising animals working for people and then the career development events or the FFA part of it. They can't, kids, a lot of kids in ag, ag education at Phoenix don't take advantage of the FFA opportunities unfortunately and so they're missing out on those pieces uh, but the kids we do get for all three parts uh, they're very well rounded. It is not a required course, it's an elective, it's, it's part of the career technical education so uh, a kid here at Phoenix does have to take three credits of either career technical education, foreign language, or the fine arts and so ag education falls, in, falls into that but it's not a required course. It's, we have about 700 plus here in the high school and between my teaching partner and I we see about 230 kids a year and that changes we have a lot of semester classes so that changes through the semesters uh, so we probably see a quarter of them at least uh, currently we have I think 40 FFA members last year we finished a year with six, 50 or 60 I can't remember off the top of my head so, uh, we are very very small in terms of our families that actually make a living in agriculture that we get here. We have a lot more that uh, have hobby farms or that maybe have agriculture as their hobby, not necessarily their living, uh, but not very many that make a living in, in agriculture. So agriculture education uh, helps give students the background knowledge they need to pursue a career in agriculture. Uh, through all of our standards, through all the stuff we do, and unfortunately in agriculture, especially in our valley, it is so expensive to get started because ground is, is hugely expensive. So what we can give the students is we can give them that passion uh, because the second they get that passion then they won't ever quit at it. They'll, that'll be stuck with them. Uh, whether they're just raising a couple of lambs on the side, whether they're getting their kids to raise lambs later on in life. It's amazing how many former students uh, that aren't currently involved in agriculture but still do something with agriculture because of that passion that's been laid. So that's the best thing we can get for them. And then aside from that, we can also give them some background knowledge, some people to talk to, uh, some places they can go, maybe some career opportunities. Uh, we have a good working relationship with uh, the Oregon Department of Agriculture in terms of getting some students uh, when they qualify to different areas. We also have a good working relationship with other organizations like the Farm Service Agency uh, and we can send kids off to, to farm credit services to try to get things accomplished if that's what they want to do. A little historical perspective, uh, FFA came about in 1928 and actually agriculture education started in 1917 so we're in the centennial year of agriculture education which is pretty exciting. FFA came about in 1928 
And then there was that gap, and it was originally started for to teach young boys how to farm. And that's what it was there for. And so women didn't come into the FFA until 1969. And so if we think about it, 1970-ish, so we're like, what, 36 years roughly, 46 years roughly, excuse me, since women have been involved in agriculture education in FFA. And our chapter is probably two to one, girls to boys. Maybe even three to one, girls to boys. I think it can't do anything but help it, to be honest with you, because the more uh, non-traditional folks we can get to at least care about agriculture, to at least have a passion about it, the better off we're going to be. And traditionally, uh, a woman's role in agriculture has not been that what a, of what a man's has. And so if we can get more women involved, which we have done in the FFA, I mean, you look at our leadership, you look at ag teachers. In fact, I was just looking at the history of Phoenix FFA. Uh, we are in our, our first year was 1956. So we're, what, 61 years. And in 61 years, we've had two female ag teachers at Phoenix High School in 61 years. And, but we've had way more students come through uh, that are female. So it's just, it's, it's been a huge shift. I think it really helps in terms of especially the heritage. I know my wife's family, uh, my wife's a, an only child, and so that's going to be a female succession in terms of agriculture. And she's currently working on the family ranch, and that's what her, her job is. And so, uh, I mean, the more females we can get involved in agriculture, the better off we're going to be. And, and uh, it's amazing that the shift, too, that we see from time to time in terms of those students that want to take a leadership role. And, like, currently we have six chapter officers, all are female. Last year we had seven, all were female. Two years ago we had seven, two were male, and the rest were, and five were female. So we've kind of seen this, this shift not only in our chapter, but also in our leadership of our chapter. Right. Crater has a huge program, yeah. and Eagle Point has a huge program, and Rogue River has a program, and, but the Medford School District, they don't have a program. Did so they No, nope, they've never had one. Ashland's never had one. Uh, Medford's been at a few of our meetings lately, so I don't know if they're thinking about starting one. Uh, but they have been at a few of our ag teacher meetings lately. So uh, for our purposes here at Phoenix, we're guided by our advisory committee. And so with what our advisory committee considers to be the agriculture that we need to look at uh, in terms of our local area. And then as an ag teacher, we get the freedom to look at the agriculture of our state as well. So basically agriculture is anything for me, anything that can be grown from soil, water, anything that can be used and that then is legal as well to be used in, in our, not only our state, but also our nation. Well, so yeah, we don't spend as much time on pears. We talk about pears as one of the top commodities in our valley, uh, but we don't spend a ton of time on pears. We talk a little bit about vineyards. We talk about the grape aspect of it. We don't necessarily spend a lot of time talking about the winemaking because of, of are just our culture down here. But there are some programs that do spend more time talking about that. We also spend a lot of time with cattle and calves because my passion is cattle and calves and it's also, you know, Jackson County is pretty, pretty big in Jackson County. And we're number one in the state again in terms of commodities, cattle and calves were this last year. Uh, we spend a lot of nursery greenhouse time because that's something we can do here on campus that's really easy. We have a, a greenhouse. So we raise plants. My teaching partner, Hillary Walkup, she handles the plant science side of our program, uh, as well as a lot of the animal science and vet med side. I handle the welding, the ag mechanics, and the natural resources, and then the introduction. But anyway, so we have that plant sale. So we raise plants in our greenhouse. Student raise plants in our greenhouse. And we have a plant sale on Mother's Day weekend. And then we also use our greenhouse to start plants for our farm to school program and the garden here. And so we actually give them a portion of our greenhouse to use to start and then our kids help do some of those starts too. So yeah, and uh, all, all four chapters in Jackson County and Prospects in Jackson County too. I should say Prospect has a chapter as well, an FFA chapter. It's not as old as the other four, but they are active. 
Uh, not as large, obviously, because it's a smaller school out there. So, but all five chapters have greenhouses and all five chapters have plant sales. And 4-H and FFA have some similarities and differences. Uh, one of the major similarities is that both organizations are about kids. And both organizations are about our youth and getting our youth involved with something. 4-H, they have way more opportunities <clears throat> in terms of what they can do because 4-H covers so much more than just agriculture. 4-H is not just about agriculture. They have sewing, they have table setting. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine's daughter was champion table setter at the Jackson County Fair this year in 4-H, and I didn't even know they had such a thing. Uh, FFA focuses mainly on agriculture as opposed to 4-H. 4-H is for all students, 10 years old to 18. FFA is for high school students, 9th grade through 12th grade. Uh, both of them give students opportunities. 4-H is more uh, ran by volunteers. 4-H leaders are volunteers. It's kind of a more local volunteer leader uh, scenario where FFA, the ag teacher, is the FFA advisor. And so, like for example, there's five chapters in our county. There might be 20 4-H clubs that do various animals. So those are the main differences. The other thing that we'll find is that in, in 4-H, uh, when I first got here to Jackson County, uh, when I started teaching at Crater, when I was a student teaching, I was an assistant 4-H leader uh, for a small beef club. 4-H is one of those things that, one of those organizations that relies a lot more on parents, a lot more on parental support. And we still rely upon parents in the FFA, but not nearly as much as, as they need to in 4-H, because our kids are older. Well, county Fair is just as big a deal for FFA as it is for 4-H. Our kids compete in our FFA shows at County Fair and then they sell in the Junior Livestock Auction with the 4-H students. So those are combined? Correct. Okay. So this last year, we had an amazing year in Jackson County. Uh, the sale actually grossed $1.2 million, which is just phenomenal. And so in the sheep, pigs, and steers even, it's about uh, three or four 4-H four animals to every FFA animal, sometimes a little more. So we're not nearly as large, but we are involved in that. And so like last year, students at Phoenix High School made around $30,000 with their projects, selling them at the county fair. Yeah, which is amazing for our, our school. Really not counting the ones that did it in 4-H, because we, we have a lot of members that do like their pigs or steers in FFA and they do their lambs in 4-H. Because we have a really good lamb club here in our side of the valley, it's called Wagner Valley Sheep. And Julie Lockett is the leader of Wagner Valley Sheep and she is an amazing 4-H leader. Uh, and she has done just an awesome job with that program. And so they have uh, quite a few of our Phoenix FFA members become uh, junior leaders of that 4-H club and a lot of them take their lambs in that 4-H club, which is totally awesome. I mean, there's a lot of counties you go to where there's this 4-H FFA divide and it's not that way yeah. for us anyway. Yeah. I also do all the uh, technology for the Jackson County Junior Livestock Auction. And so I work with the Extension Office <clears throat> uh, for that because they're a huge part of that Junior Livestock Auction. I mean, they're one-fifth of the of the numbers. So I worked with Kim Skamurza quite a bit on that uh, and then Ann Manlove before she retired yeah. on that. So it's made a difference to all kinds of kids. Uh, one kid in particular I could think of, uh, his name's Jake Ersig and he was a squirrely freshman his freshman year and uh, my wife will tell you that I was not very impressed with him as a freshman which is totally accurate. Uh, but at the same token I never gave up on him even though I wasn't very impressed with him as a freshman. He went on to become a state FFA officer he got his American FFA degree. Uh, he just recently got married to another state FFA officer from John Day, who incidentally enough, her ag teacher was Chris Kaiser, who went to school here at Phoenix and graduated from Phoenix High School. And uh, so he, Jake went to Phoenix, graduated from Phoenix, met Nicole from John Day. They got married just this last year. He is currently at NC State working on a master's degree in ruminant uh, monogastric nutrition with an emphasis in hogs. Uh, his wife, Nicole, who is a state FFA officer, she is working for a 
agriculture blog uh, there in North Carolina. And so he it just didn't, and he went to school at Oregon State and then transferred to K State, got his degree in K State, and we actually stay in touch quite often. Uh, it's a cool thing about my job to to meet those former students. Uh, another former student that uh, was a uh, boy I, when I came here, my first year was 2006. She was a sophomore in 2006, and she competed in Parley Pro, went to nationals in parliamentary procedure. She competed in floor culture, went to nationals in floor culture. She competed in a speaking contest. She ran for a state office. She didn't get elected, which was unfortunate. Uh, but then we got the pleasure of hiring her three years ago to be our other ag teacher. And so we got the opportunity to work with her again, and her name's Hillary Walkup. And so it's really cool to be able to work with somebody who you taught when they were in school, but who also, her only school that she's ever been to has been Phoenix Town School District. I mean, clear up from K through 12, and then she went and got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, now she's back here teaching. In terms of day-to-day -day that helped transform a student, uh, you know, who knows? It could have been they found a love for something we were talking about. It could have been they developed a passion in something. I can speak to myself, uh, when I was a student, in at Malala, I was in the Malala FFA. I did a couple of contests, livestock judging and ag sales and then parliamentary procedure. And then when I was at Vail, I did livestock judging and ag sales and parliamentary procedure uh, in the FFA. And it, it really turned me to agriculture, that I wanted to do that as a career. Not, not teaching, obviously, because I didn't come to that until much later, but something in agriculture. Uh, the spark just kind of hit. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed livestock. I really enjoyed the friends I made with livestock judging. I really enjoyed uh, the parts of, of livestock judging where you got to be with people, you got to work as a team. I enjoyed that stuff. And then the backside of it in terms of livestock judging, you're picking the best animal out of four. So then I got the opportunity to go judge a bunch of shows. And so I judged a bunch of shows all over the state, uh, judged a couple shows in Idaho, a couple shows in Washington, and just got that opportunity. Uh, and then you think about, wow, well, let's, how do we make those really good animals? And how, what are our breeding decisions that go into that? So then we've gotten to do some of that too with, with my wife's family's ranch uh, and our cows that we have. And so I think for me, it was just a passion for agriculture, not from a little young lad, because I wasn't into it when I was young. I mean, I didn't get started until I was a seventh grader. And so I was pretty late coming to the to the agricultural realm. So anyway, uh, but we hope when we see them in class, any one of those kids, that we can, we can get a connection with them. And I, I was taught a long time ago that, that teaching's not necessarily about the curriculum, it's about a connection. And it's about making that connection, that relationship with those kids. And if we can connect with them, and we can develop that relationship with them, why then we've We've, we've got them and we can show them what to do and, and what, what, uh, what the whole big exciting world there is out for them. I've only been here for 13 years uh, and in that 13 years it's, it's been really interesting uh, in terms of the things that have happened, in terms of the, the most interesting thing I think happened just a couple of years ago with a ban on GMOs in our county and so that, that's a huge shift from uh, what is acceptable in terms of as a nation, national agriculture. In fact, we were just back in Indianapolis, Indiana for the National FFA convention and we spent a little bit of time in Illinois on a farmer's dairy and uh, we were talking to him about corn and all the corn back in Illinois, Indiana, it's all GMO'd corn. And he was just in awe that there would be an area that was GMO free like ours. So that's been the biggest change I think to our valley. Uh, other changes in Oregon, the hard thing to keep family farms going, family ranches going, is the inheritance taxes and the expenses of those inheritance taxes. Uh, that's a challenge in terms of what's changed agriculture. And then the other thing is labor costs. Boy, labor, health care, uh, sick time, all that stuff has just had to change. We've had to get more modern, we've had to do things more efficient with less hand labor, which is hard in a lot of our, I mean, there is no machine that'll pick a pear. I mean, it is not a mechanically picked crop, and yet it is one of our huge crops here in the Rogue Valley, and so it's totally relied upon labor 
to pick it. And labor is expensive, especially now where we've got minimum wages going up. We've got sick time at the state level anyway that's coming. And so it's an expensive deal. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, cattle and calves in our valley, uh, we've, there's a lot of ground that's been lost that can no longer be utilized for raising cattle because it's raising other, I don't want to call them a crop, alternative uh, products now. And so there's a lot of that going on in our valley, which has changed some of the things that happens too. Heritage. Heritage to me is the roots you have. It is what happens before you. And I'm really into history, which is kind of cool. And so your heritage is what you can look back on. My son is the seventh generation to be born on my wife's family's ranch in Eagle Point. And so his heritage is everything that we have there. And we still, and my father-in-law has done a fantastic job of taking care of things. And so we have all that heritage for him. We still have, in fact, I just found it. It's kind of embarrassing to admit I just found the single bottom plow that his great-great-grandfather used when he first plowed. And I found it in the weeds, pulled it out, and now it's in our flower bed. Uh, hopefully one day to restore. But we still have all that historical machinery, that heritage. We still use the horse barn that their family used to, to team up the horses to plow. We still use that for our horses. Uh, we don't have draft horses anymore. We have tractors. Uh, but we still use that barn. And so you can still see in, in the barn where the floor you know, has been worn back and forth by those draft horses that spent so much time in there. We still have the harnesses hanging up. Uh, so that's what heritage means to me. Stewardship, boy, what a great word, stewardship. Stewardship to me is taking care of what you have and making the best possible decisions that, so that you can not only utilize it for your benefit now, but also the benefit of your family later on. And so it's taking care of your resources. And again, my father-in-law has done a fantastic job of that. Uh, we also have some timber ground. And so in terms of that, we harvest trees and we replant. And not because it's the law. A lot of people don't know that. But legally, you have to replant. It always gets me when some people think, well, they're just going to cut everything down. No, in Oregon, you have to replant. But we don't do it because it's, it's the law. We do it because it's the sustainable thing to do for our family. Uh, hopefully, we've got some little pine trees at a couple of places. And, and uh, hopefully, my son, in 30, 40 years, will be able to harvest those trees and do something good with that money, whether it's uh, pay for something or pay for college or pay for some new machinery that he needed to buy, whatever. That would be stewardship. So sustainable is, to me, it's using products, using the, our natural resources in a way that they will be around for generation and generation. And I say using because we still have to use them to be sustainable. I, I don't believe sustainability is just letting them sit by. I believe sustainability is actively managing them because if we're not managing what we have, we're not doing a very good job for our future generations. And uh, it's amazing. Every decision that's made on my wife's family ranch is not only about today, but it's also about tomorrow or the next day or the years down the road. Because it's been in the family for that long, it's a huge priority to keep it in the family even longer. I think it's really important that we look back to where we've been so we can have an idea of where we're going because we need to learn from the past. And a lot of people concentrate on learning from the mistakes of the past. And I think we should concentrate on learning from the successes of the past. I mean, there are things that have been done in our valley for a number of years that may or may not be necessarily the way it's done everywhere else, but it works for our valley. And so I like to look back on the way things have been uh, to look towards what's going to happen. I think it's really important. I get the opportunity to do what I love a lot, and I get the opportunity to share that with kids. And I do love teaching, but I, I love agriculture even more. In fact, this last weekend, uh, Veterans Day weekend, which we, we're very thankful for our veterans too. That's another part of heritage, uh, at least at the Stanley Ranch, is to thank those who have served before us. But this last weekend on Veterans Day, uh, got the opportunity to uh, gather one of our meadows up in the mountains. Uh, on horseback, drive cows over, haul them home. Saturday got to do that with my son. Uh, he's not old enough to be on a horse yet, he's not quite four, 
Uh, so we were on a four-wheeler, he and I, and uh, we were doing that together. So, just amazing.